Hey everybody, welcome back for week four of virtual learning. Um, I'm really missing you guys right about now. I love getting to see you guys on Zoom and talk about what's been going on with you, your favorite parts of our book so far. We have three more weeks including this week. So after this week, we've got two more weeks of how to eat fried worms. And then you will be able to take an AR test on this book if you would like. The electronic copy is on Connect, so you can read the book. If you want to read ahead, you are more than welcome to. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and dive in with our weekly assignments. So um, this week, we have exactly the same kind of assignments as last week. Um, you're going to have a classwork assignment that is a Google form um, for how to eat fried worms. It's going to be based off of our reading skill and this week our reading skill is going to be point of view. We're going to be talking about um, the narrator's point of view, character's point of view. So that is a mandatory classwork assignment. That means that it is for a grade. You have to do it. Um, in addition, you're going to have a couple of assignments that you can do if you want for an extra grade that are classwork assignments. You'll have a vocabulary study, you will have another grammar class work, and you will have another writing class work if you would like to do some writing. Those are all available under weekly classwork on Connect on the English Language Arts page. Um, another assignment that you must do this week are the comprehension questions, and they will be the comprehension questions for chapters 11 through 20. Um, like I said before, you can look back at the video, this video of me reading the book. You can um, use the electronic copy as you do the assignments, and I will be putting some timestamps down below where you can see which chapter I read at what time in this video. Um, in addition, you have the art and the PE participation survey. Make sure you are filling that out. Um, those are the two resource classes that are for a grade. Skills, media, and tech are optional. Um, you're more than welcome to do those. They will be on Connect as well. But the PE and the art are mandatory. They're for a grade. So if you don't do it, um, that could affect your grade in those classes. I will be putting the weekly checklist on Dojo and on Connect, both on the English Language Arts page and the Social Studies page. A lot of people have been telling me that's really helpful, that they've been um, either printing the checklist or writing the checklist down on paper and then marking it off as you finish those assignments. That is a great way to keep yourself organized and on track. I'm going to go ahead and start with our vocabulary for this week. So this week, again, we have 10 vocabulary words. Our first vocabulary word is hayloft. A hayloft is a high platform reached by ladder inside of a barn. So it's that part up at the top of the barn, a hayloft. Our second vocabulary word is trousers. Trousers are pants. Um, I kind of like the word for pants, trousers. Our third vocabulary word is rumple. When you rumple something, you wrinkle it. So you might rumple a piece of paper. You could rumple someone's hair or a shirt might be kind of rumpled. Our fourth vocabulary word is jostle. Jostle means to roughly push or bump against. I think we've talked about jostling about before, um, but it means to roughly push or bump against something. Our fifth vocabulary word is treacle. Treacle is molasses, which is a dark brown and sweet sticky syrup. So think of something really yummy like syrup on your pancakes. It's like a treacle. Our sixth vocabulary word is serene. Serene means calm and peaceful. It was a serene afternoon on the beach. Our seventh vocabulary word is offhand. If you do something offhand, you're doing it without thought, in a cool and calm way. It just happens naturally. Our eighth vocabulary word is gnaw. If you gnaw, you bite or nibble persistently. Think of a puppy. Puppies like to gnaw on bones. Our ninth vocabulary word is virtuous. Virtuous means you have high moral standards. So someone who is very virtuous probably won't cheat or lie or um, 
do those things that they know are probably not right. They want to be very kind and they've got things that they know are right and things that they know are wrong. And our 10th vocabulary word is neutral. If you're neutral, you're not helping either side in a dis disagreement. You can say, I'm neutral, I'm out of this, and it means that you're not one way or another. Those are our 10 vocabulary words. Those will be the words that you use for the vocabulary study if you do it, and you're more than welcome to look at the words on Connect as you complete that assignment. I'm going to go ahead and dive in this week. We are reading chapters 11 through 20. How to Eat Fried Worms by Thomas Rockwell. Chapter 11, Tom. Billy pushed the frying pan toward Tom. Okay, Fink, if it's not supposed to hurt you, you eat a piece. Oh, no, said Alan. He and Joe were lying on their stomachs in the hayloft watching. If he eats a piece, you lose, Billy. The bet was you were going to eat 15 worms, not you and him together. Billy didn't look up his eyes fixed grimly on Tom. All right, then I'll go dig another worm, just for him. He's so big, telling me, hurry up, hurry up, I can't wait around all day, don't be a sissy. All right, now, I didn't say sissy, said Tom uncomfortably. I just said if the first four worms didn't kill you, this one wouldn't. I can't help it if my mother told me to be home by two today. She's going shopping, so I have to mind my brother. Yeah, said Billy. Okay, so we'll just have time for you to eat a worm before you go. Come on, where's the shovel? Here, said Alan from the loft. We brung an extra today. A worm dangled squirming from his fingers. He dropped it to Billy. It's not cooked, said Tom. I'll do it, I'll do it, said Joe, scrambling down the ladder. He took the worm from Billy and ran out, then ran back and grabbed the frying pan. Tom sat down on an overturned pail to wait. He didn't want to eat any worm. It wasn't his bet. He glanced at the door creaking in the wind. Maybe he should make a break for it. Of course, he could see Billy's point. Billy didn't believe Joe's story, but still. He'd find it reassuring if Tom ate some worm too. He'll eat it, Billy was saying to Alan. If he don't, he's chicken, said Alan. After all, his talk. Why don't I eat it, thought Tom. I mean, it's a yucky thing to do, but it wouldn't kill me. He scratched his neck, shifting his seat on the pail. I don't know, thought Tom. I just won't, I guess. He gagged, imagining what it would be like to bite down on a soft, fat, boiled worm. He glanced at the door again. Billy kicked the door shut. Leave it open, said Tom. Why? Because I said so. Yeah, well, you don't own this barn. Neither do you. Your father does. Billy rubbed his nose, watching Tom, figuring, he's trying to pick a fight so he won't have to eat the worm. Okay. Billy opened the door and set a brick against it. Tom shifted his seat on the panel again. He couldn't stop thinking about what it would be like to bite down on a soft, fat, boiled worm. He scratched his ear. Who did Billy think he was, trying to order people around, telling them what they had to eat and all? Billy wasn't anybody's father. Tom began to feel put upon and indignant and stubborn. A screen door slammed, Joe coming back with the worm. Tom licked his lips. He heard Joe running across the barnyard toward them. Billy! Alan shouted. Billy spun around just in time to catch a glimpse of Tom pelting out the door, the door banging shut. He flung to the window. Joe sprawled in the middle of the barnyard on his back. Tom was clambering over the wall into the meadow. The frying pan lay upside down beside the horse trough. Chapter 12, The Fifth Worm Look, Billy said to himself, staring down at the fried worm on the plate. Be sensible. How can it hurt me? I've eaten four already. Tom was just scared. He's like that. He hugs other people on, but he never wants to do anything himself. Give up? asked Alan. Come on, said Joe. We haven't got all day. Five more minutes, said Alan. Then I win. There's no time limit, said Billy. 
For the first time, he wondered what he'd do if he lost. Where could he ever get $50? But how could he eat 10 more? Big, fat, ugly, soft, brown things. He couldn't ask his father for $50. He heard Alan and Joe whispering together. He's going to quit. Yeah, I knew he'd never make it when I bet with him. He talks big. Him and Tom are just the same, but they never do anything. Billy gritted his teeth, glopped on ketchup, mustard, salt, grated cheese, whatever was on the crate, anything, everything, and then grabbed up the worm and tore it apart with his hands, stuffing it into his mouth, chewing and chewing and swallowing and gulping. Then, panting, he reached out and wiped his gooey hands on Alan's trousers and grinned messily up at him and said, There, five. Chapter 13, Nothing to Worry About. That night, Alan asked his father to show him $50. After that, he couldn't sleep, tossing and turning in his rumpled bed. Suppose he lost. He could just see himself asking his father for $50, begging for it on his knees, tears streaming down his cheeks. And then, at Thanksgiving dinner, cringing while all his aunts and uncles and cousins roared over his father's story of Alan's bet. He slid out of bed and snuck down the carpeted hall to his parents' bedroom. You got to wake him, Mrs. O'Hara. You got to he whispered into the phone. It's an emergency. I got to speak to him. Pause. I got a hoarse throat, Mrs. O'Hara. That's why I'm whispering. Please. Pause. Gee, thanks, Mrs. O'Hara. No, I won't ever call this late again. It's just, it's... He waited, gnawing at his thumbnail. A board creaked on the stairs. He stiffened. Silence. What do you want? said Joe suddenly over the telephone. Geez, I was sleeping. You woke me up. Joe, suppose I lose. My father will never let me take the money out of my savings account. I know he won't. You think I'll lose, Joe? Huh? Huh? Joe, tell me. Give it to me straight. Joe, I got to know. I can't sleep. Joe sighed. Look, I told you this afternoon. You got nothing to worry about. He's cracking. Sure, he ate that one today. Sure, he might. End of chapter 13. He's getting a little worried. Billy's a little braver than he thought. Chapter 14, The Pain and the Blood and the Gore. Four blocks away, Billy suddenly found himself in a brightly lit butcher shop jostled by a crowd of enormous, pigeon-breasted, middle-aged women shouting to make himself heard over the din of their chatter and the roars of butchers ordering about the weasel-faced boys who were lugging haunches and tubs of meat in and out of the refrigerator room in the rear. Then a butcher saw Billy jumping and jumping among the women and asked for his order, and Billy gave it. And suddenly, he was shoved up close to the chopping block, and the butcher slapped down ten black worms as big as snakes, and Billy tried to say they were too big. He'd choke on them, but the butcher couldn't hear him over the thumps of his cleaver and the din of the women and the hoarse shouts of the other butchers. And before Billy knew what was happening, he was seated at a table in Longchamp's restaurant in Times Square in New York City with a large napkin tied under his chin. And a waiter was uncovering a platter on which lay one of the huge black worms, coiled snakily, a red, red rose wobbling in the center of its coils. How can I ever finish it, said Billy, and cut into a mammoth coil. Steaming pink juice flooded out. Billy ate and ate and ate and ate and then looked and, and he must have eaten more than that. And then he looked again and there was no hole at all. He had eaten and eaten and eaten Nothing at all. And then he felt something cold on his ankles and looked under the tablecloth, and there were two more of the huge worms wound around and around his ankles. And then he felt something weighing down his arm, and he looked, and there was another worm wound around his arm, glaring hungrily at him with its bloodshot eyes. And from everywhere in the vast room, winding between the tables, waiters approached carrying huge silver serving platters,
Billy opened his eyes. For the first moment, in the moonlight flooding his bedroom, his two bare feet sticking up out of the bottom of the covers looked like two huge white worms' heads. And then he realized that he had been dreaming and sank back onto his pillow, the nightmare melting away. There were no huge worms as big as pythons. He was home in bed. His parents were asleep in the next room. His stomach rumbled. But suppose Joe hadn't been lying. The hair stood up on the back of his neck. Or suppose Joe had made it all up, but had been right anyway without knowing it. A shudder banged. Billy glanced out the window and saw the moon riding among the tossing leaves. His stomach rumbled and gurgled. He groaned. Suppose he was dying. He'd heard of people waking up in the middle of the night with pains in their stomach, and then, as the windows turned gray in the dawn, they died. Toadstools, soured lobster, tainted pork. That was a pain! He clutched his stomach and groaning, half fell, half staggered out of bed and hobbled toward the door, bent double. Maybe there was an antidote, he, wh he whimpered. It didn't hurt a lot, but nothing ever did to begin with, did it? Chapter 15, 3.15 a.m. His mother reached out and switched on the light. What kind of pain, Billy? He stood beside the bed, clutching his stomach. In my stomach, oh, there it goes again, I think. Did you eat something before bed? She was pulling on her bathrobe. John, John, she shook her husband's shoulder. He mumbled sleepily. Did you eat candy or something before bed, Billy? Worms, groaned Billy. Worms? John, John, Billy, what kind of worms? Regular worms. Night crawlers. She felt his forehead, lifted his chin to look in his face. You don't have a temperature. How many worms did you eat? Five. Two boiled and three fried, with ketchup, mustard, horseradish, salt, pepper, butter, to make them taste better. Fried? Ketchup? Taste better? John, wake up. I had this bet with Alan. Oh, he groaned again. Take your hands away. Where does it hurt now? Show me. It doesn't really hurt so much now. It's just rumbling and gurgling. Something awful. It's... Then why are you groaning? Asked his father, sitting up. Because I'm afraid it's going to start hurting. Do you think I'm going to die, Daddy? Worms? His father asked. Ordinary worms? Earthworms? Billy nodded. And how many did you eat this evening? One this afternoon. I've eaten one every day for the last five days. But they weren't little ones. They were night crawlers. Huge ones. As big as snakes almost. His father lay back down, pulling the covers up around his shoulders. Don't worry. Eating one night crawler a day for six weeks wouldn't hurt you. Go back to bed. It's probably all the ketchup and mustard that's upsetting your stomach. Drink a glass of warm water. John, are you sure? Asked Bill, said Billy's mother. It doesn't seem to me that worms could be a very healthy thing to eat. John? His father snuggled deeper under the covers. I didn't say eating worms would turn him into an all-American fullback. I just said they wouldn't hurt him. Well, let's go back to sleep. Billy's mother glanced at Billy, shivering beside the bed in bare feet and pajamas, and then shook her husband again. John, John, wake up. I think you should call Dr. McGrath. You don't really know whether or not eating worms is harmful. I know you don't. Billy's father groaned and sat up. <sighs> now look. I am not going to call Dr. McGrath at 3.30 in the morning to ask if it's all right for my son to eat worms. That's flat. Secondly, I do know that Billy's not going to die before morning. If worms were poisonous, which they're not, he would have been laid up before this. Billy, you've been eating worms for five days? Billy nodded. All right. And thirdly, 
I ate a live crayfish when I was in college and have suffered no discernible ill effects. And fourthly, I am going to sleep. Millie's mother slipped her feet into her slippers, stood up and buttoned her bathrobe, and then leaned over the bed and shook her husband's shoulder. John, John, I won't be able to sleep until you call. John, John, what about tapeworms or a fungus? John, wake up. Billy, you go back to bed. Your father will call Dr. McGrath. John, John. Billy lay in bed listening to his mother and father arguing in their, in their bedroom. He could only make out a word here and there, usually when his father started to shout, only to be shushed immediately by his mother. Billy got sleepier and sleepier. His stomach had stopped rumbling and gurgling. It was warm and cozy under the covers after standing on the cold floor in his bare feet. Then, in the midst of a foggy drowse, he heard someone dialing the phone in the hall outside his parents' bedroom, and then his father say, Poison control, and explain the case. Then there was a silence. Billy heard the water running in the bathroom, and then his father said, You're sure? These weren't little ones. These were night crawlers. Pause. And no long-range ill effects. Pause. His father laughed. <laughs> A bet, I think. And the next thing Billy knew, sunlight was streaming through his window, and Emily was skipping down the hall past his door, singing. Half a pound of tuppany rice, half a pound of treacle. That's the way the money goes, his father shouted down the stairs. Helen, do you know where my green tie with the red stripes is? Chapter 16, The Sixth Worm. Seems poison control didn't think there was much of an issue. Billy gulped it triumphantly, serene, untroubled. By the door, Alan glowered, his mind racing. He's going to do it. He'll win. What'll I do? Fifty dollars? Joe sat on an overturned pail, whistling, gazing carelessly about, sneaking a glance now and then at Billy. What had gone wrong? Why hadn't he cracked? Outside, Tom lurked sheepishly in the bushes behind the stone wall, peering at the barn. Chapter 17, The Seventh Worm This is progressing quicker and quicker. Billy ate it offhand, sideways, reading a comic book. Alan and Joe squatted glumly in the barn door watching him. As Billy was daubing horseradish sauce on the last bite, Tom's head appeared in a corner of the grimy window. He waved tentatively at Billy. Ignoring him, Billy gulped down the last bite, wiped his mouth, and, tucking his comic book under his arm, strolled airily out of the barn, remarking over his shoulder, See you tomorrow, fellows. Chapter 18, The Eighth Worm It doesn't seem like Billy's too worried at this point. Where's Joe? asked Billy, spreading mustard down the length of the fried worm. He wouldn't come, said Alan sullenly. It's no fair putting on that much mustard, <laughs> said Billy. Who says? I can put on as much as I like of whatever I like and you know it. Why wouldn't he come? How should I know? Billy swooshed a bit of worm around in ketchup and horseradish sauce. I know why he didn't. Yeah, you're so smart. Big deal. Alan couldn't get the $50 out of his head. What was his father going to say when he told him he'd bet $50 and lost? Jeez. He gnawed at his thumbnail. He wouldn't come because he knows I've won. He knows I could eat 20 worms if I had to. Yeah? Yeah? Well, you ain't won yet. There's still seven to go. You act so big. Wait till you begin to feel it in your stomach. You think you know everything? Yeah. You'll see. You wait. Huh, <laughs> said Billy. You think you can scare me talking like that? Fooey. He strolled past Alan out into the sunlight. Hi, said Tom, popping up from behind a barrel. <laughs> said Billy disdainfully and walked on. Chapter 19, The Ninth Worm. That's not a worm, yelled Billy. How can it be a worm? Jeez, it must be two feet long. 
It's a worm, said Alan stubbornly. It's just like all the others. I rolled it in cornmeal and fried it. It's over two feet long, screeched Billy. He knew something was up. Otherwise, Joe wouldn't have come back, slouching in the doorway, pretending to be gazing up at the clouds. But Billy noticed he kept glancing at Alan and him, and Tom was peering in the window again. Something was up. Look, said Alan. I'll cut it. You can see for yourself it's a worm. There. See? Come on. Eat up. We ain't got all day. Joe and me have to go to Shushan with his father. Billy poked at the huge worm with his fork. Something sure was up. He ate the piece Alan had cut, looking the rest of the worm over carefully as he chewed. He ate another bite. Ugh! He'd forgotten to dip it in the horseradish sauce. Come on, come on, come on, said Alan. Yeah, said Joe. Eat up, Billy. We gotta go. I'll never be able to eat the whole thing, thought Billy. It'd choke me. It's too much yuck at once. Half, he croaked. I'll eat half. This is some sort of a ringer. There's never been a worm this long. Okay, said Alan. Then the bet's off. Suit yourself. Come on, Joe. He chickened out. Let's go. All right, all right, said Billy, playing for time. The whole thing. You'll make yourself sick, said Alan. He's too anxious, thought Billy. What's going on? Leave him alone, said Joe. Let him eat it. It's his stomach. He's trying to cover for Alan, thought Billy. He ate another bite. Then he began to scrape the cornmeal carefully off the worm with his knife. What are you doing, said Alan. I think I'll have it plain today. No cornmeal. That's not fair. You can't. Glue, screamed Billy all of a sudden. Glue? You glued two crawlers together? Jeez, you bunch of lousy cheats. Tom, Tom, look what they tried to pull off. Glue. Panting, Tom bent over the plate. You're right, jeez. Alan kicked a pail clattering against the wall. I told you it wouldn't work, he screamed at Joe. All right, so it didn't work. You couldn't think of anything better. That's cheating, said Billy. I ought to win right now. You cheated. Fifteen worms in fifteen days, yelled Joe. You ain't won yet. But you cheated, shouted Tom. So what? They argued and yelled, striding here and there about the barn, sprawling against posts, flinging up their arms, kicking walls, banging down on a pail or orange crate, and squeezing their heads between their hands. It doesn't make any difference, Joe yelled at Billy. It didn't work. You didn't fall for it. If you'd eaten the whole thing and then found out it was two worms glued together, then you could have claimed to win because Alan was cheating. Big mouth, shouted Alan from the horse stall where he was kicking the slats in. Who thought it up? Not me. Who cares who thought it up, shouted Tom. It's still cheating. A pig looked in the... And, a pig looked in at the door and then wandered away. Joe ran out and stuck his head under the faucet by the kitchen steps. A minute later, he came running back, dripping, yelling, That's not true! What's not true? said Billy, turning around from shouting at Alan. Whatever you said. What did I say? It doesn't make any difference. You're a liar and a cheat, and so anything you say isn't true. You're crazy. Even Hitler or... Or Jack the Ripper sometimes said things that were true. It's impossible to lie all the time. Behind them, Tom lay down on his back and said, Ugh. Alan and Joe and Billy turned to look at him. What's the matter with you? Ugh. 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 Silence. A bird flew in and then out through a broken window in the loft. Well, said Billy. Yeah, I see what you mean. He and Alan and Joe sat down on the overturned orange crates. After a while, Joe said, Anyway, I was right. If Billy'd eaten it, it would have it would have been cheating. But he didn't, so it's not. The bet's still on. The pig looked in at the door again. A pig's loose, said Alan. Look. Where, said Billy. Oh, boy, come on. We gotta catch it. He jumped up. The pig bolted. Woo-wee! yelled Billy, dashing out. 
Tom and Joe and Alan scrambled after him. Chapter 20, Billy's Mother. Ooh. She didn't seem too pleased last time. Billy slumped at the kitchen table on one elbow, pawing in his bowl of Wheaties with his spoon. His mother was washing the breakfast dishes at the sink. But why isn't it good to eat hot dogs for breakfast? I know nobody does, but why don't they? Oh, Billy, said his mother. Stop it. Finish your cereal. Well, but... A knock on the screen door. Billy's mother glanced around. Oh, hello, Alan, Joe. Is your sister better, Joe? Yes, thank you. Billy can't come out until he's finished his breakfast. Would you like to wait for him on the front porch? We came to see you, Mrs. Forrester. Oh, come in. Mrs. Forrester, said Joe, as Alan shut the door carefully behind them. I don't know if you know about it already, but see, about a week ago, Alan made this bet with Billy about eating worms. If Billy could eat 15 worms, one each day for 15 days, then, Billy, you're not still eating them. Billy stuffed a spoonful of Wheaties in his mouth. Not just worms, Mom. I've been eating lots of other stuff, too. Look at me. I'm healthy. Dr. McGrath told you the worms wouldn't hurt me. But, Billy, Dr. McGrath didn't think you were going to keep on eating worms. Joe nudged Alan and grinned. Oh, Mom, if five worms wouldn't hurt me, a few more won't either. They're little worms. Besides, it's a bet. If I... They're big worms, Mrs. Forrester, said Joe, looking virtuous. We won't lie to you. My mother told me never to tell a lie. Munner, said Billy. Mom, it's a bet. I told you, if I win, Alan's got to pay me fifty dollars. Fifty dollars? Young man, don't you move from that chair. She went off into the front hall. Thanks, whispered Billy. But you'll see, it won't work. Alan and Joe gazed nonchalantly at the ceiling. Billy's mother's voice came from the front hall. Dr. McGrath, I'm awfully sorry to bother you again. It's such a ridiculous matter. But since I spoke to you, Billy has continued to eat worms. Pause. No, no, it's nothing like that. He's acting perfectly normal otherwise. It seems he made a bet with some other boys. Pause. One every day, he has to eat 15 to win his bet. Pause. Oh, thank you, Dr. McGrath. I'm so sorry to bother. She returned to the kitchen. But no more bets after this one, Billy. Alan and Joe, don't you egg him on any more. He's far too eager to do wild things. Billy yucked silently at Joe and Alan. Alan made a rude gesture at him. Mrs. Forrester, said Joe, what we really came about is that Alan and me are going up to Lake Lauderdale today with my father to fish, and we won't be back till tomorrow night, so we wondered if you'd make sure Billy eats the worms today and tomorrow. It's not that we don't trust Billy, Mrs. Forrester. No, said Billy's mother, smiling. But it's always better if there's a referee, you know, like Mr. Simmons says at school, to save arguments and hard feelings. We brought the two worms. He held up a paper bag. We boiled them already, so you can just keep them in the refrigerator. Well, said Billy's mother, this is quite a responsibility. Are you sure I'll be neutral enough? I am his mother. Yeah, we thought of that, said Joe, but we figured, well... You're usually pretty fair, and besides, parents almost never cheat kids if it's just something between kids. They're usually pretty fair until they get into it. Billy's mother laughed. And how does he eat them? Just cold-boiled? Well, we've been frying them, Mr. Mrs. Forrester. We roll them in cornmeal and then fry them like a fish. But he can do whatever he wants, except that Alan and me have decided it's not fair to make soup out of them or chop them up like hash or a chicken salad sandwich. He's got to eat them piece by piece. Who said, yelled Billy. When was that ever in the rules? We said, shouted Alan. Billy jumped up, kicking his chair over. Well, then I win. 
because it's cheating to make up new rules in the middle. Oh yeah, shouted Alan. Then you lose, because anybody knows it'd be cheating to hash it up. You think you're going to weasel out of it after I've already eaten nine? Who's weaseling? You're cheating. Yeah? Yeah. Boys. Boys. Billy. Alan. Silence. Please. Now, Billy, I think, no, let me speak first. I do think Alan and Joe are right. It wouldn't be fair to cut the worm all up. You can just think of some other way of fixing it. Thank you, Joe. She took the paper bag and looked inside. Phew. Billy, are you sure? Mom, you've eaten eels. You ate eels last summer in Long Island. These are just smaller. They're the same thing. Well, she put the paper bag in the refrigerator. I guess if Dr. McGrath says it's all right. Now, why don't you all go outside? I wouldn't go across the street with those finks, said Billy. They can, yeah, shouted Alan. Well, who'd want to go anywhere with you either? Yeah, shouted Billy. Boys, cried Mrs. Forrester. Stop it. All right, Alan and Joe, you had better go. The screen door banged behind them. Pfft, said Billy scornfully. Joe's face appeared at the screen. Thanks for saying you'll help out, Mrs. Forrester. And that is it for this week. I did not expect Billy's mom to be in on the bet. Didn't think that would happen. Turn of events. Remember, your assignments will be available from Monday until Sunday of next week. Um, Sunday the 19th. So make sure you're getting those assignments done. If they say mandatory, they are for a grade, um, and you have to do them. They say optional, you can do them, and it's extra points towards your grade. So I would suggest doing those if you have the time. Um, if you have any questions, remember to send me a message on Dojo. I'll have two Q&A sessions again this week. They'll be available on the checklist for you. Um, if you need anything, let me know. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I will see you soon. Bye.